Okay, so now I take the sacred bone and shake it. Then I take my wand and wave it in a circle as I place my hand through the flame and say the magic words. Klatu, Varata, Niktu. Klatu, Varata, Niktu. I am just not made out to do these rituals. I'm sorry. Well, <clears throat> what I would like to say is, hello everyone, welcome to the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. I'm Ray, your audiobook reviewer, and I'll be reviewing some recent and classic Lit RPG audiobooks for you today. Today, I'm going to begin with, if you couldn't have guessed, The Ritualist, The Completionist Chronicles, Book 1 by Dakota Kraut, narrated by Vicus Adams, and the book's length is a small, very short, stunted, truncated 12 hours and 6 minutes. Um, I don't know if you understand that, but it wasn't long enough for me. Satisfaction with the term. He would reach his dream eventually, but he needed a way to make money. Elon turned his mind to his past interests, the internet, renewable energy, and outer space. Over the next few years, Elon rose like a phoenix in the tech world. He started a payment system, multiple companies, and finally, the pinnacle of his dream, a privately owned space research center. Space Y. Then the stock market crashed, and he was out of money. Well, for a very short amount of time. With newfound free time, and after years of putting it off, Elon devoted his efforts to researching the core more directly instead of simply carrying it around as a good luck charm and reminder. After weeks of preparation, Elon hooked energy-sensitive wires between the core and his personal computer in an attempt to analyze it. His monitor flickered, and the metrics on the side of his screen went haywire. There was no way that his Wi-Fi had just transferred 43 exabytes of data, was there? Elon stared at his shifting monitor as text appeared on it. Wow, about time. Smells kinda musky in here. So this is what the world is like now, huh? You humans have some splaining to do. Now the first thing I'm going to say is ritual is necessary for us to understand anything. That sounds very deep. So... By, by saying that, I'm going to expound. I really didn't want to like this book. I wanted Dakota Kraut to just keep putting out the Divine Dungeon series until it was finished. Now I'm absolutely torn. I still want the Divine Dungeon series, but now I also want more of the Ritualist. Kraut is just an incredible writer, and you get sucked into the story immediately. I really appreciate how he gets the character of Joe, the MC, into the game so quickly and doesn't screw around with all the usual angst or cognitive dissonance most main characters display when they are about to go into a virtual world permanently. Nope, we go straight to the game and we are all the better for it. I also really, really appreciate that Joe gets a secret class with special skills and that he works for a hidden god. It's really, really fun listening to him try to keep things straight because once the cat's out of the bag about his secret class, he loses all of his benefits and he has some really sweet skills. The only thing that really throws me off is that the main character basically enters the VR world because he's a quadriplegic and yet he still opts to get a body that will be winded from walking about 10 feet too far and could probably be beheaded from a paper cut, if you want to have me be totally honest with you. The guy is not big. He's a wimp. Actually, he's a wimp's wimp. I've seen wimps come up and kick sand into Joe's face on the beach, okay? Um, so, because of that, you would probably expect Joe to take a big manly body, big, muscular, powerful, high-constitution, uh, bodacious bod, that he doesn't have in real life anymore. And 
you kind of understand why he doesn't because he's really in this for the long haul. He thinks about a lot of things before he does them. And he weighs very heavily his options as he goes through the book. And the first thing he does is set back and decide, is it really going to behoove him to take this secret class and work for a hidden God? He gives himself every opportunity to opt out if he decides not to. But in the end, even though he's got all these really big guys to pick from for bodies, he opts to go with the ritualist class because he sees a lot of hidden potential there. And that's like probably one of the best parts about this book is that most people would have gone for a rogue or a wizard or a swordsman, and he doesn't. And actually, Crowd is about the only dude that I know that can make a healer not only exciting, but a total bad grass mamma jamma. If you want to know the fact about it, Dakota manages to make the cleric class <laughs> really exciting and interesting. Most people would have passed this up automatically just to get themselves a really good high power go out and fight kind of class. Joe doesn't. Joe really outthinks everybody. And the ritual stuff and the occultist profession are just interesting as all get out. And if you're going to ask me, how do you make what is basically a librarian interesting? I'm going to say, I don't know. You have to ask Dakota Kraut because that's exactly what he does. Okay. He takes a librarian and turns him into a monster class. Now, as for the narration, Vicus Adams had me way back with the Divine Dungeon number one, Dungeonborn. I love his characterizations and the humor he injects with his voice. There are very, very few narrators who are as skilled as he is, and he really just moves the story along at his own pace, and it's a perfect pace. The man is an absolute pleasure to listen to, and his female voices are just as good as his male ones. And I have to say, I was really, really happy to see that he didn't go with just the same old voices that he had done in Dungeonborn, you can hear um, almost as if they were ancestors or descendants, I should say, from previous voices like the Wisp. She's there, but not quite all the way. You can tell that the voice stems from her, but it's not her exactly. And it's a treat to get a, a taste of, of the Wisp from Dungeonborn, but not have it be her all over again. So I got to say, he really does really, really well with his voices. Another thing that I give Kraut total points for is including a nod to my beloved dungeon, Cal. Uh, Cal in this book has a lot of similarities with the other Cal. Both are fair, they're easily annoyed, and they're ready to dole out proper punishments and rewards. So I'm hoping Dakota will give a nod or a shout out to everybody's favorite wisp in the next book. Joe is a completely fun character. His class is interesting, exciting, and you always want to see how he's going to change things up. It's that factor, the the how can we do things differently, that really makes this a standout book. Um, now, we just need to get Dakota back to the Divine Dungeon, and I'll be a satisfied guy. You will be satisfied if you get this book and the Divine Dungeon. This is, right here, without question, one of the best lit RPG game lit books I have ever read. My final score, 8.5 out of 10. It is near perfection on the page, or I guess in this case being audible on the airwaves. And it is totally music to your ears. So don't miss this book. If you have passed it up, or if you, you didn't like Divine Dungeon and you decided to not get this, rethink that strategy because you will be Utterly shocked, surprised, stunned, and eventually come to love The Ritualist. Okay, so the next book I'm going to do is Outpost, Monsters, Maces, and Magic, Series Book 1 by Terry W. Irvin II, narrated by Jonathan Waters, and the book length is a perfect 7 hours and 23 minutes in length. Kalgor positioned his long sword, preparing to draw it across the throat of the nearest slumbering guard. Wait, Kirby said. We can try to interrogate them for information. Kalgor tensed, preparing to follow through with what he'd intended, then thought better of it. We need rope or something. Dude, there's a jail back there, with chains and all. Kirby wiped his cutlass clean on the pants of the dead leader. Jax, get back there. 
Lysi needs your help. Glenn nodded once, his arms starting to get some feeling back. Lysine was leaning against a wall, Marigold standing in front of him. Here comes Jax, she said. That lizard man fought well, Ron commented. One should expect that of a second-rank monster. Steffi's eyes were wide. He's hurt pretty bad, Jax. In game terminology, Ron said, I estimate having, at most, two hit points. He forced a brave smile, but winced. Before he realized what it would entail, Glenn dropped his cudgel and shield and began his minor heel draw spell. In a moment, Glenn gasped, then groaned as he gripped his side. But within a moment, his magic began to heal the damage he'd drawn upon himself. Now, if you saw the first audio, little audiobook podcast that I did, then you know that one of my all-time favorite books is The Sleeping Dragon. Book one of the Guardians of the Flame series just took me and made me love this genre way back when. I also enjoyed Quag Keep as well, so I think you'll understand when I say that Game Lit is probably one of my best subgenres that I can find. And if I can get a really good one, I am a happy, happy camper. Now, I really respect and admire these people that write Andre Norton, Joel Rosenberg, um, for their creativity and amazing characters. I now add Outpost to that list. There is just something that really appeals to me about RPGers getting sucked into the world they play in. It's fun and fascinating if it's done right, and Terry Irvin does it right. We start out with three students who are looking to write a class paper who end up joining a local gaming session for their sociology class. There are also three regular players, one of whom of those regular players is a kid from junior high. The MC is one of those students who's looking to get his sociology paper done. And it's kind of a necessary perspective for the listener, since the world is supposed to be all new and shiny to him and you as well. So it's good to have one of the, the students who don't know anything about role-playing be the main character. And he ends up becoming a gnome healer. The other students, both female, opt for a warrior monk and an elven mage. And one of the best running bits and gags is how the kid from junior high tricks the one girl into playing an elven mage with having a porn star type body with goddess looks. Her boobs are good for more than a few chuckles throughout the whole book. Each of the characters are interesting. And if I have to speculate, because it's not revealed just yet, not all of the characters or the players, I should say, are neutral or good. I really think that one of them picked a dark alignment without telling the others, because it's pretty obvious if you pay attention throughout the book. Uh, for me, it's the characters that sell this story. Each is distinctive and have their own voice, but the real standouts for me were the gnome, the half-goblin, and the elf female. One of the things that I love so much about the Guardians of the Flame series was it was not afraid to kill off characters, and that is a big thing for me. If you are willing to off characters and make it realistic, then I am really, really happy because I just can't stand books that go through and never kill anybody. One of my most treasured series in the whole world for any kind of genre at all is the original Dragonlance series, the first six books. And they do one hell out lot of killing in that series. I mean, there's one that dies just from a heart attack, one that's murdered by her friend, actually a lover. I mean, you go through, people get whacked in that series, and not everybody makes that alive. And in fact, if you go past those first six books, the majority of the people who were in the original books don't make it out anyway. Sorry if that's a spoiler. But that is what does it for me. I really, really like to see characters in Jeopardy. They don't always have to die, but I have to know that there is that potential. And here, that potential is realized. Just like in Guardians of the Flame, one of the members of the troop gets killed off rather quickly. So the troop then has to figure out how to get back home and possibly resurrect their, their comrade on the way. And the answer to what happens with both of those quests might just surprise you at the end. The book isn't all crunchy and full of stats and numbers, and that's really fine here. Uh, it works the way it is set up, and you won't miss any of those aspects at all. Um, the only complaint that I had from the whole book was the shifting of the characters' real-life names to their gaming names. They're used interchangeably, and it, it, I could see where I, I followed along no problem, but I could see where it could be confusing to someone else. Like, for example, my wife would be 
totally lost, totally completely lost with the name changes if you would go back and forth between the junior high kid's real name and his goblin name, all right? Or the elf maiden, you know, she's Marigold, and give her her real name, Stephanie. My wife would lose her mind and not have a clue. She would think there were 12 characters instead of six, and I can understand that, and I think that you just need to pick one or the other. So if they're in-game, use their gaming names, or if they don't like that, use their real-life names, but just pick one and stick with it. And that's like my only real complaint for this book. Um, so I followed along, no problem, but I can, like I said, I can see where it could be confusing. Um, Water's narration is really, really fun. And he does the ladies' voices about as easily does the men, uh, the men's, which is impressive. Uh, I only know a handful of narrators who can carry that or pull that off as easily as he does. His reading is rock solid. And the sound quality is fantastic, and he really infuses a ton of emotion into this story. I have not heard of him before. I mean, I listen to a lot of audiobooks, um, but I have to admit, I was really impressed with him here. The book was very enjoyable. I appreciated the story, the quest, the characters, most especially. Like I say, this is a character-driven story, and if the characters hadn't been as fleshed out as they were, it would have fell flat on its face. So I have to say, I really enjoyed this book. I, I think you will too. The audiobook is really good, especially if you like game lit. This is a perfect game lit subgenre book. Absolutely. Eight stars for a fun run through a dangerous world with some slight points shaved off for the confusing name issues. All right, next up, we're going to do Respawn Killstreak, book one by Stuart Thaman, narrated by J. Scott Bennett, and it has an audiobook length of eight hours and 39 minutes. He's fast, Sizak hissed, keeping his wand ready and a spell at the front of his mind. Cataracts didn't waste his breath on a response. The jackal was quicker than any opponent he had fought before, and he needed something unexpected something obscure to turn the tide. The wall will not hold much longer, Sizag said. Should we flee? Eldritch fire, Catarax yelled as he completed the spell. A burst of bluish-black flame licked out from the end of his dagger toward the ice wall. A quick activation of perfect timing let him flawlessly judge the expiration of Sizag's conjuring, Snapping his wrist forward, a burst of black fire cascaded through the falling, dissipating ice and fully engulfed the howling jackal. Cataracts lunged forward with his blade, shielding his eyes from the painful mixture of fire and ice raining down on his shoulders. Now, I have to be honest with you, this book was rather difficult for me. It isn't bad, but I took umbrage with a lot of things that either lack explanation or make no sense in the book. The premise is that a man from Earth, hence the title Earthborn for his, his classification by the other natives of the world, uh, awakens one day in this strange world. He struggles for a number of years to get back home and finally gives up and decides to acclimate after an incident causes him to fend for his life. Now, the funny thing is, and I'm going to just kind of go off, off topic here for a second, and we'll just step aside. Um, in this world... You level up as a character. You pick a class and you level up. And I just, I find it very hard to believe that not only he, but other Earthborn do this process where they don't pick a class or do anything for a number of years because everybody has to choose something that they're going to do. So I don't know how he survived, what he ate, how he lived. It just, it's not there. And that's what I'm talking about. There's a lot of gaps or empty spaces or lack of explanations or plot holes. And that's just one of them. Um, so let's just go back into it. In this world, you you seem to play, and I'm only assuming this because it's never stated in what is considered to be a hardcore mode, okay? You get one life, and if you die, you lose everything and have to start all over from level zero, uh, which would totally suck if it were a game. If you were literally playing a game and you played that game for weeks or months or even years with one character and that character got jacked and you had to restart, it would just be one of those things where I would put the game away and never, ever play it again. But it's never stated that this is a game. It doesn't tell you anything. All he knows is he woke up somewhere and this is what life is like now. So I don't know. I just don't know. But oddly, this happens to everyone 
everyone in the game, okay? You die, and you get reborn, and get to pick a new life. Old crap you've done is forgotten or forgiven, and you can re even, even reestablish old ties or connections if you want to. So basically, the only thing you had to fear from death is having to restart your life over. So I guess, if this is the case, if you really, really hated your job, you could just kill yourself and pick a better one. Because there's nothing that stops you from picking a class or a job or whatever um, that I know of. They just sit down at, at an inn and they make up a couple of discussions with some people and decide what they want to do. So it's just very, very confusing on how things work. So why would it matter if you're earthborn? Because there's no distinction between the people from earth or the people who are native to the land. And that was another thing I just didn't comprehend. Why even have that distinction? Because as far as you would be concerned, everybody's the same anyway. It's like saying I'm from, you know, Ohio. And so therefore I'm different. Oh, you're Ohio born. What does that make a difference of? I don't follow that line of thinking. If it was a game and they were trying to do that, you have all kinds of different names to describe people who respawn and come back to life, you know, travelers or, I mean, you name it. There's just, a, there's a dozen different things you could call the people that get their, their life back over again. Earthborn would be one, but there's no reason to distinctively single them out because everybody is the same in this world. Um, the weirdest thing in the whole book, and I have to say it just like this, the weirdest thing in the whole book is the main character's companion, um, who just happens to have been his pet snake on earth. Now he has no idea how he got to earth, how he got to this world, let alone how in the hell his pet snake got to this world. Not only did it come to the world with him somehow, but it also became a PC or an NPC or whatever kind of C you want to call it because it's never explained, and but it's referenced numerous times. Like, they don't just say it one time as a throwaway line, like, oh, this guy used to be my pet snake. The pet snake mentions it. He mentions it. You know, Catarax, the, the, the main character, says it a, a thousand times that this guy used to be my pet snake when I was on Earth. So there has to be a reason for it. But it's never given any explanation. And like I say, this is the stuff that takes me out of the story. When I had to sit there and say, why would that even make a difference? Or why does this matter? Or how does this apply? Or what difference does it make? I'm not listening to the story. I'm going off on a tangent in my mind to somewhere I shouldn't be at that point. I need to stay with the book. Um, and and that, that's another thing. There, there was a total lack of consequences for anything that is done. Nothing is explained and there's no sense of danger at all. I mean, I really had a hard time worrying that cataracts, the main character would have to restart his life over again. If he died, the book is just basically the MC and a couple friends either doing some fighting or slice of life sort of stuff or hanging around trying to score XP level. It's just, you know, slice of life, go grind, whatever. And also the new class that the MC takes is really vague and mysterious. Now, if you remember, I did a re review on the ritualist by Dakota Kraut and there I pretty much point out how brilliantly Kraut does it because he lays everything about the class out to the reader and to the character and lets everybody else in the book be totally clueless about it here. It's just vague and mysterious and there's no, rhyme or reason or, or even trying to decide like when he picks his special abilities what difference they make i mean it, it, there's nothing really there um so i just i don't know i really dig new classes but i don't see how you can handle figuring out a class you've never heard of before um Thayman just does not do that he does not give you anything to handle this class with it almost seems to me like he's making it up as he goes along now the class has a Lovecraftian feel to it which I respect uh, there's madness craziness whatever you want to say um, and there's a lot of things to deal with pain and suffering so it, it is a touch Lovecraftian but it's just way too mysterious to tell anything about it even at the end of the book um, there's no payoff. The ending is just an ending. There's no big battle, no climax, not even the slightest hint of resolution. The story does nothing to move ahead. Nothing, which is really sad because it could have been a tour de force with just some simple explanations and consequences stuck in there. The writing is not bad. It just has nowhere to go. 
it just wanders aimlessly because nothing is revealed. And I don't know why he's holding things so close to his chest, but he shouldn't do that. You, sh you as a reader or as a listener should have an idea of what's going on in the story. And if you're left clueless, have those clues revealed to you or given to you a taste at a time. None of that happens here. A good, a good editor could have given this some direction and helped him out a lot. And I don't know if he didn't have anybody to kind of say, Hey, you're missing a lot of stuff here or things that are necessary for the story. But I really wish he had, because it could have been a really, really great story. Scott Bennett, like I said before, handles the narration and he's one of my favorite narrators. Seriously. I know it isn't lit, but I do want to give a shout out to his, his other series just so you can find them and enjoy them. Um, the brother bone series is magnificent. The death master book is just great. Check them out here. He does what he can and it's a fine job. Um, he's fun to listen to. He paces the story out. Well, he does everything that he can to elevate this story. I really respect what he does here. And I have to say that the sound is flawlessly fantastic. Oh, but the, 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 the plot holes and the missing information just, just drove a dagger into my heart. And I hate to say that. I think Feynman really has a lot of potential and could really crank out a fantastic book. So for this, I'm going to give it six out of 10. He just needed to flesh out the world more and not kept, like I said, everything so close to the, to the vest. It could have been a fun book and the things here that could have been interesting. And we, but we just didn't have an idea of what the hell was going on. Never, ever keep your readers out of the loop. I mean, that's like just the worst thing to do. Give them a taste or a hint. Keep them interested. I will get the next book just to see if he reveals anything or if he makes some changes or adjustments. I sincerely hope so because this has a ton of potential. But right now, it, it just kind of lost me for a little bit. I will come back to it because it's not horrible. It's, it's just a middle of the road kind of story. It could be a top of the road top of the hill kind of story. Okay. It just needs a little bit of work, polish it up and give us some information and everything will be amazing. All right. Next up is rapture apocalypse gates author's cut book one by Danny Shinifin narrated by Andrea Parsnow. The book's length is 11 hours and 30 minutes. It was when Bill was moving the fourth wreck off the road that Becky called out contact. She yelled just before her gun fired. Alvin and James spun to face her side of the street. What Alvin saw was a nightmare for people afraid of bugs. A six-foot-long scorpion was scuttling toward them from a side street. Becky's shot had made it pause, but the pellets only seemed to ricochet off its carapace. James got the next shot, and again the pellets from the shotgun bounced off its shell, but it flinched down as if protecting its eyes. Alvin leveled the Tommy gun. He had made sure it was on semi-auto. The first three rounds from the magazine impacted along its back. Two of them didn't seem to do anything. The third shot hit the tail, knocking it backward. When it came back up, it didn't arch as high as it had before. With a click of its claws, the mutated bug started forward again. It rushed forward faster than the trio expected, closing the distance as they all fired again. At 50 feet, the buckshot from the shotgun started cracking the shell. It slowed as it twisted side to side to avoid taking damage to its eyes. The next few rounds from the Tommy gun cracked right into the faceplate of the scorpion, shattering the plates but not punching through into the body. With a high-pitched scream that hurt their ears, it dashed forward again. They unloaded their weapons into it as it came closer and closer. Now here, Daniel Shinifin has written something that I have really been waiting to hit Audible for some time. Horror Survival Lit RPG. Survival Horror isn't a huge setting in the genre. I mean, I don't know if you, I don't know why. I don't know if you can tell me there are other books out there. I'm sure there are some that have been written, but they're not on audio. Um, sometimes it seems, seems as if we are really lucky to just get some sort of story that steps outside of the generic Western fantasy or science fiction. Like I would love to see a Western style fantasy lit RPG book a la Red Dead, Red Dead, Redemption, if I could say that properly, Red Dead Redemption, um, or something comedic. But most especially, I've been waiting for a horror style lit RPG audiobook. I mean, just imagine, you know, someone trying to survive Jason or Mike Myers, uh, or, you know, 
werewolves or zombies or anything. There's such a rich possibility and potential out there for these styles of books if it's done right. Uh, so I was really, really, really happy to see someone had finally gotten to this and put it on Audible. Because I know there are some out there, but it's on Audible and I'm happy for it. Now, I, <clears throat> I want to say the book is very, very well written and the characters are all stand out. Okay, I really enjoyed and adored Gothy far more than any of the other characters. I like the Shinifin slips in some jokes here and there without announcing what he's talking about. They either are, are jokes that you get or you don't, such as him wanting to rename the AI uh, known as Scotty and the Betty. And you just either you get the joke or you don't. Uh, the book, and I'm not going to spoil it for you. The book has a solid crunch to it for the gamer fans, but there were some things that I found strange, such as when the MC Al tells everyone they're trapped in a video game, you just don't see that normally. He just comes out and announces it to everybody he meets. Hey, you're in a video game and I'm the hero. Um, now, one thing that did set me off a little was the easy pathway to weapons and unlimited ammo. And I'm trying not to give spoilers here, so I'm going to have to try and just keep it a little bit backed off. But for the entire beginning of the book, Al does his zombie whacking with a wooden baseball bat. Uh, and they don't last long. So he's got to keep buying them or upgrade. Um, and it's hard for him to upgrade because upgrades cost experience points. And he doesn't get a lot of that starting out. I mean, if you think about it, when you play a game, how many experience points do you really get? So the next thing you know is he's upgraded the guns. And, and then before you know what's happening, he's already got that upgraded to having unlimited firepower. Now to me, what makes a good movie like Night of the Living Dead fun is that the people are fighting the undead, but they have limited weapons and resources. I mean, when they're in that farmhouse and they're trapped, there's only really, you know, one or two guns that show up and they're out there fighting people off, the zombies off with torches and it's not going very well for them, okay? Or they're clubbing them down. Limited weapons make really good survival horror. And and I, I think that we kind of skipped that problem really far too quickly because we, we, we kind of focus on base building and saving survivors. Now, on top of the zombies, we also get a few other creepy creatures that show up by the end of the book. And I'm really looking forward to what comes next in the series as the escalation seems to be right on point. At first... It was a little slow, and it does kind of spin its wheels a little bit as we go through the base building process and, and picking up survivors. Um, there were just some things, you know, that were obvious, like the, the doctor who rubs out the wrong way. Uh, that's every horror movie that you see, so that fit right in. But that just kind of drug a little bit for me, and we could have sped things up with some sort of an assault or fighting off the zombies on the base we don't have that. And that's that's kind of what I was hoping for, was something really big at the end. And the, the ending is nice, and it does continue on. It's complete. The book does come to a conclusion, but leave things open for the next step. But I really wanted some huge, huge fight that was going to be amazing, and or, or a, a good standoff or something like that. And that, that's my only complaint, is we don't really have that. So I just wish that next time around he takes that in consideration because this book by Shinifin um, has a lot of potential and I really liked it a lot. And I, I think that with the escalation that comes at the end of the book, all that stuff I'm talking about will play right into it. Okay. Now the narration is performed by the excellent and adorable Andrea Parsnow, who seems to really enjoy playing Gothy, which is great because she makes that character shine. She does a fab job on the other voices and maintains the pace and flow of the story effortlessly. Effortlessly. If I could say it, it would be better better off. But anyway, she does it effortlessly. I actually kind of got upset when she had to switch off her Scott voice for the AI and switch it over to the AI's new personality voice because she really, really killed it as Scott. His snarky attitude was just well played by her. And it really reminded me of another character from a book um, that I don't think fit her quite as well before. Uh, 
and it came out here and I thought, man, this is just perfect. This is where that voice belongs. So Scott was really good. And not that the, the new character that comes in or the, the new personality for the AI comes in isn't just as fun, but I was really, really enjoying Scott. Um, so I can't just say enough how much I enjoy her work here. And if we do have a rapture and for some odd reason, Andrea is not taken. I do hope that she makes play by plays over loudspeakers as people get mauled by zombies. Just going to put that out there for you. My final score is eight points out of 10. Mostly, mostly, mostly because I felt no real sense of danger after the initial break in phase for Al was finished and for robbing us of seeing Al struggle a little bit more than he could have when scrounging for weapons and ammo. I mean, that's really a huge part of every horror movie. Um, if you're, you watch, uh, Mike Myers in Halloween, the, 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 the main character, Jamie Lee Curtis's character stabs him in the eye with a coat hanger because that's all she has on hand. Uh, you, you go through things like that all the time. People generally don't have weapons right on hand or available, or they have to make makeshift weapons and him having access to purchasing weapons is one thing. That's fine. But having an instant availability like he does for the weapons that he ends up getting just kind of put me off a little bit. But I mean, the book is really good. It's well written. The characters are fantastic. I can't wait to see what happens with Gothy next. And Al, for that matter, I keep putting Al down. But I mean, honestly, Al has Ruffian and Gothy, so I can't be too, you know, I'm going to be a little jealous of him because Gothy is really awesome. And Ruffian is a sweet ride if ever there was one. So there you go. Anyway, go out and get the book. It's very enjoyable, and it's great to finally see a survivalist horror lit RPG hit the audiobook waves. And I ask if there are any other books out there in that subgenre of lit RPG, let me know in the comments below so that I can go and find them, because it's something I really enjoy. I love scary movies, horror movies, whatever you want to call them. I, I have watched them since I was knee-high to a grasshopper, and this is something I've been waiting for. So please do me that courtesy if you have a chance. Once again, 8 out of 10, and get that book now. Thanks so much for watching, everyone. I really appreciate you taking your time to watch or listen to the show. If you uh, want to support us, we would ask that you could go and like the Lit RPG podcast Facebook page or the YouTube page, or just share and like the video. Also, I would ask if you could to please leave a comment below. I like to... Uh, get feedback and see how I can improve and anything I can do to make the show better. That's what I'm going to listen to. So make sure you leave a comment and I'll be happy to get back to you uh, for the lit RPG audiobook podcast. I'm Ray. Keep listening. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. Thank you.